If you're watching this, you're part of a revolution. And you know why I say that? A majority of people are choosing to come to online media platforms and the mainstream media is breathing its last moments before it's rendered completely irrelevant. That's exactly the realization Jordan Peterson just had, and I don't think anyone has been able to put a finger on what this is doing as Jordan did in this conversation with Chris Williamson. Just take a look at this before we get into it. The legacy media uh, types are, they're done. They're so done. It's, and it's happened so fast. I notice among young people that the legacy media, the big magazines, the newspapers, the TV stations, the radio stations for that matter, all of whom had a monopoly on this kind of information flow are so dead to people under 30 that it's as if their death isn't even noticed. That's fascinating. And yesterday I, I interviewed Richard Tremblay and Richard Tremblay is, a, is in his 80s and he's a scientist who studied, a research scientist who studied male and female aggression for 40 years. We had a two hour conversation and I thought afterwards, I thought, you know, I've only been able to have conversations like that in graduate seminars, in the highest quality graduate seminars, in the most elite universities, now and then, even though I was placed to have those conversations, two hours on a single topic, covered in as much depth as possible um, by, by someone who's a world authority. And now I can have that conversation with people and 150,000 to a million people can have access to it instantly. It's like... I think God only knows what that is going to be the consequence of that. I was interviewed by a Wall Street journalist last week, and I asked him what he liked about podcasts because he listened to them a lot. And he said, I really like to see where they're going. And I thought, yeah, that's exactly it. Because in a legacy media interview, everything is scripted and you're never talking to a person. You're talking to the corporation, <laughs> essentially. And I'm not being cynical about that. It, it had to be that way because... Bandwidth was so expensive. But now you can sit down with someone and you can risk exploration. Of course, that's what Joe Rogan has been doing so well for so many years. You can risk exploration. You can have two people having a genuine discussion about a complex issue. And so they're, they're engaging in dialectical thinking. And if they're good at it, they're modeling it. So they can model high quality dialectical thinking and pull people along on an exploratory journey and make it permanent. And that's completely revolutionary. That's never been possible before. And, and, and the possibilities are limitless. The next thing is you can take those conversations and you can chop them up into 30 second pieces, a minute long pieces, five minute long pieces, 20 minute long pieces. And each of those can find a specialized home that can attract millions of views. And so it's as if you could write a book and sell it by the sentence. I think there's one core reason that explains this. Simply put, the barriers to content production and reception have eroded so greatly in the online world that no mainstream television production can ever hope to match it. Take for example a pretty simple setup with a news analysis show on cable TV. Even the simplest production can end up costing in the tens of thousands of dollars per episode, including everything from paying the guests or contributors the editors and writers, as well as the many staff needed to operate the elaborate technology used. Contrast this with a news video blogger online who can even work through their phone and stream straight to thousands of people for practically zero cost. Do you see what that does? It's almost like the chaff falls off the mainstream media and the conversation is put front and center as the thing the audience wants to see. With a financial disparity like this, there's no way that a cable news talk show can compete for long with the digital space, but I think there's something that a lot of people miss when talking about the mainstream media, and that's the direct impact of this financial disparity on the content of those shown. Here's a simple rule of thumb, the more a show costs to produce, the more it is financially vulnerable and beholden to people or groups that finance it. In the case of the legacy media, it's reliance on mass advertising, corporate sponsorships, political donations, and the need for large revenue to offset the cost means it will always prioritize profit over telling you the truth. I think it was Noam Chomsky who made this clear all the way around half a century ago with the book Manufacturing Consent, The Political Economy of Mass Media, 
To quote a sentence from the book on the necessity of the media to look after its bottom line, it says, and I quote, the dominant media firms are quite large businesses. They're controlled by very wealthy people or by managers who are subject to large constraints by owners or other market profit-oriented forces. And remember, this was said at the very height of the mass media revolution back in the 80s, when a media industry becomes desperate to hold on to any relevance that it has. You'll often see this truth about the media magnified and amplified. If you're a large media executive or producer telling the audience the blunt truth about what's really going on, falls further and further in the list of priorities because there's dozens of choke points in the hands of powerful people that don't want you to tell the truth. But that grip is slipping every passing day, as we saw happening to cable news, what happened to the radio before it. The millions of people that used to be consumers of information have now also become producers of it in their own way. And as a result, we're seeing mainstream cable television desperately clawing for any attention it can get. For example, it was shown that after the end of the Trump presidency, the pandemic, and the end of the 2020 presidential cycle, mainstream television in the United States went into a tailspin that looked irreversible. CNN's ratings dropped by 52%, MSNBC saw over 50% of their core audience leave, and Fox News saw a decline of 37%. You see a similar story with the digital print media. The interesting thing that I think I enjoy about podcasts and a lot of audiences do as well is that unscripted nature. But it's not just the fact that the topics are unscripted, it's the the cadence and the the timbre of the the tone of the way that the conversation flows as well. If you struggle to work something out, if you're battling at the forefront of your own cognitive capacity to try and get yep. something from brain to mouth, we get to hear. I'm yep. brought along and where it's almost like a football match or a sports game. We're willing the person yep. to get yep. to the goal. Absolutely. The players are trying to put something into the goal. Well, that's what you're doing when you're having a genuine dialogue. You know, it isn't necessarily clear what the goal is, it's more implicit because you're, you're starting to make that more and more clear too. There has to be this continual reciprocity and that requires you to attend very carefully to your guest and to listen. In two hours, you reveal your hand and everyone can see it. You reveal the weaknesses and strengths of your argument. You reveal the weaknesses and strengths of your character. You know, but, but in some sense, you can, even if your character is flawed, like all of our characters are, you know, if you're engaged in something genuine and in, in a genuine move forward, you're forgiven for that, right? It, it, if, if, you're, if you're actively rectifying your evident flaws during the discussion, people will forgive you for your flaws, but YouTube and podcast long form seems absolutely unforgiving of any <laughs> falsity, as far as I can tell. I mean, sometimes we do some editing. Eh? There, there's two conditions under which we'll edit. One is just to edit out some technical glitch. We also allow our guests um, the option of not having something they said broadcast if they believe they've made a factual error or addressed an argument um, in a misleading way. And that's a li little bit more of a moral quagmire, but our thought is that if we allow people that veto power to begin with, they're much more likely to be loose and to take risks in the exploration. And we've had to cut virtually nothing except, I think, two factual errors of a few seconds. But it's so interesting because in the comments section, if we ever edit anything, there's skepticism right away. And so, and so that's another indication of how unforgiving the medium is with regards to falsity. That's the thing, because when it's unedited, when it's a flowing conversation for a long amount of time, the precipice on either side, you are walking a tightrope, as you said. There is no yep. opportunity to go away and check what you actually want to say and rewrite it in a script. It is riding the crest of now because there's no way that you can hold up a persona for two hours straight. But I think you can make mistakes, but if you're bargaining in good faith, the audience will forgive you for your, for your mistakes. So, but, but you're punished brutally if you're false. Let me tell you something interesting that ties perfectly into that. Do you know the one type of television broadcast that was most pivotal in getting the TV into every house? It wasn't the news, but entertainment. The high cost of this new technology in the early 20th century meant that large audiences were needed to recover the cost and entertainment in the form of sports and TV shows were the primary ways to make that happen. Sure, news segments that kept people informed about world affairs were also important, 
but the medium and format of television was never really meant for long-form conversations and deep intellectual discussions. In the later years, we saw the media try and adapt to some form of news analysis with 40-minute scripted question-answer sessions, interrupted five times with ad breaks, and for the longest time, there was practically no technology available to satiate the deep hunger for intellectual engagement until now. So in the sense that it's not like the mainstream cable news, it's giving up something that belonged to it in the first place. It was never meant to spur true intellectual debate, but to sell scripted and cut up news segments to people who had no better options. But now when the mainstream media has been exposed as only a mouthpiece for powerful interest groups, it has all but lost the credibility it wanted to retain. I think that's exactly what we see with the relative failure of streaming services launched by mainstream television channels like CNN Plus and Fox Nation that are struggling more than you would think considering the big names behind them. This truth is demonstrated by just how fast the trust in the media is diminishing among the young audience. A poll from Gallup and the Knight Foundation revealed that more than 50% of people believe the media actively intends to mislead them. That's a population that will almost be impossible to pull back, contributing to the slow but sure decline of the MSM. I think Jordan Peterson understands that well because at no point in his life did his ideas get so much traction as with the digital media and YouTube. He's written books, distributed recorded lectures, made mainstream television appearances, but he only found a truly global audience with the help of the internet, and it seems like this example is only a microcosm of what is happening on a much broader scale across the media landscape. 